<laughs> so, now, since we're talking about the tabernacle, we're talking about the house that God built. It's a holy house. And it was a holy pattern. Have you ever had to do a job for a perfectionist? <laughs> or maybe you're a perfectionist in your work. Well, all the articles, the whole tent of meeting, the Ark of the Testimony, everything had to be precisely accurate to the detail. The materials, the colors, the size, everything. And everything was anointed with holy oil. Everything was consecrated. Everything was sacred. Everything was set apart. Every bit of it dedicated to service. Dedicated to worship God. It was dedicated for a spiritual purpose. There was nothing that was not spiritual about it. All of this, I'd love for you to see. I'd love to have it right here, right now, and have us be teaching and, and learning right in it, right in that atmosphere. I think of Tehillim Psalm 24, verses 3 in the beginning of 4. Who may go up to the mountain of Adonai? Uh -huh. Who can stand in the holy place? Those with clean hands and a pure heart. Wow. Perfection? Oh, yes. Do I feel inadequate? Oh, yes. Am I thankful that we start at the altar? Yes. <laughs> the directions were given for the bronze altar, though, not for the sacrificial altar. In our parsha tonight, it's the bronze basin. It was the, the washing where it was placed was between the tent meeting and the altar. And it was for the priests. It was where Aharon and his sons were to wash their hands and their feet. Now, why didn't they have to wash everything in between? <laughs> Because remember their robe. And the robe was a picture of their position, the priestly position, as we see the robe of righteousness that Yeshua puts on us. That's what was making the rest pure. That outside that could be seen, the hands and the feet were symbolic. And of course, we know the symbolism with that. But as soon as they had washed, they were also to be anointed. They had to be consecrated to serve as the Kohen. The pure incense is burning, and, and it wasn't ordinary, and, and they were told even in the combination of the spices that they used, I, maybe it's not spices, but whatever you should call it, you know, to make essential it. Oils. The oils. Essential oils. I hear it, Bruce. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Here's our accuracy. Yes, <laughs> but they were even told, don't use that for anything else. Right. You're not mm -hmm. to use this and turn it into a perfume for women or to bring it into your tent. This was special. This was consecrating everything for the Lord. So why such perfection? Why such purification? Even at its best, it's not going to measure up. Mm -hmm. It's just not. Remember? There is an original. The original was not the one we're reading that, that gets built. The original is where? Heaven. 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 So anything here on this earth, I don't care how good, it's still going to be a copy. But you know what? There's something about a copy. Has someone ever copied you? Sometimes when you're young, you don't like that, especially if it's a little sibling copying you. <laughs> but really, it's a compliment. You know, it's, it's, they're seeing something of value, and they're wanting to copy that. And I hear Shaul Paul say to us, imitate me. But he doesn't stop there. Imitate me as I imitate Messiah. That's 1 Corinthians, and that, that is chapter 11 if you want it. But that's the whole point. He pointed everyone to Yeshua. And the tabernacle, the whole point, this replica, this exact copy, this had to be perfect, as perfect as humanly possible because it was all pointing to Messiah. It's all portrayal of Mashiach, of his atoning work. It was so important that God did something very special that we read about when he gave the directions. Moshe saw that the heavenly was told to pattern it after, 
But then notice Moshe is not the builder. No, the builder is, and I trip on this with my Hebrew, but so, but I've practiced and practiced, but it's all L. I can't do it. It's all L. You've got to get a B and a T Z sound right on top of each other. Good no, luck. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. So who is he? <laughs> you know who he is? I'll tell you who he is. He's the son of Yuri. <laughs> Who's he? I remember him. You remember him. Good for you. Who's he the son of? The tribe of Judah. Yehuda, yes. But who is he the son of? David. No, no, no. David's not yet. <laughs> He's the son of her. And there we should have the, oh, now I'm going to need my no. Because her and Aharon held up Moshe's arms in their first major battle against the Philistines. Okay. And when the arms were up in praise to the Lord, oh, yes. victory. Yeah, right. And when Moshe would get tired, yeah. <laughs> defeat would start in. So they propped up his arms, they let him sit on a rock, they held up his arms. But Aharon and her, we know Aharon, we know his position, so for her to be on the other side, he must have had a high position also. And this, but this is all, so, I did better at home. He's Ba'el. I'm going to call him Ba'eli. <laughs> I'll just slaughter him. He was a grandson of her. He's in the line of Judah. And he has a very, very special position because he's going to be the head leader, the head craftsman. I'm so sorry Carl's not here tonight. I think David's built, but I know he's one of our constructors, and yeah, I understand you can give him a project and he'll figure how to do it. Well, that's what, what he had to do. He had to figure how to do it. But God didn't just choose him and say, just go do it. What did God do? He gave him the talent to do it. Pattern. Even more, yes. the pattern yes. and the yes. talent, yes. but how, what's the phrase in our scripture? It's the crowning glory. What does it say about him? Mm -hmm. He was filled with the Spirit of God. Oh, amen. Filled yes. with the Spirit yes. of God. And remember, this is prior to our age where the Spirit comes in and permanently indwells us when, when we become believers. This is when the Spirit would come on them to help them do what God was calling them to do. And he was filled. I don't think we read, I, I didn't have time to research it, but I don't think we read of anyone being filled with the Spirit of God before him. It's, it's an introduction to that, and wow, what an introduction. Moshe was so impressed with his abilities that Moshe said of him, you were indeed in God's shadow, for you have the ability to create what the Holy One, blessed be He, has commanded me. He was so impressed. It must have been just a notch above what I think is our normal human ability, because it was spirit-filled. Spirit-filled. And they say that His name even means in the shadow of God. And you can take that in a lot of ways. The shadow, the protection of God is one way that some look at it. But I see this when they're talking about it in this here so close that he was shadowing the Lord. If the Lord moved, he moved. This way, this way. That way, that way. And just that tandem. And I think he had to have just some special connection to be able to do what he was doing. <coughs> Well, Moshe was very impressed with him, but I could say it takes one to know one, because Moshe also had the privilege of literally being in the shadow of God. He went up in that cloud. He went up in that Shekhinah glory. He went up to receive the commandments and jump ahead with me, but then we've got to come flying back. <laughs> he comes out with his countenance changed because he was in the shadow. Basking in the shadow. Yeah, 
had a sunburn. Well, it didn't burn, and it wasn't the S U N, but I like to think of it in that way. But that's our mighty crescendo. And right now, at this point, it is like everything's coming together. They've got the direction, they've got the talent. And, and as I said, he had to be able to not only do it, but if he needed to create a tool, a special tool to be able to do or to make, he had to be able to figure that out too. Right. So, wow, the talent. And God's bringing him together, gives him a right-hand assistant. Anyone know his name? I can say this one easier. The right-hand assistant, Ahaliah. Which means the father's tent. Very interesting. The father's tent. And at this point, the father's tent, everything would revolve around the father. He would be the one giving the direction. He would be the one giving the instructions. And the sons would be carrying out what the father was saying. So I think what a perfect name he gave him to be the right hand of the one who's filled with the spirit. We see this coming alive. Moshe is going up and he's having one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord. He is hearing the Lord. He is seeing to some degree. I know it's camouflaged because he survives, but that pattern is coming to life. You know, if you've ever done anything with a pattern, when you begin to see it take form, it gets exciting. And here's where I see it happening. But sadly, you know, we're on that, 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 we're building, we're hitting that crescendo, but, boy, you may. I would love to leave the picture beautiful, but I can't, because that's not how it stayed. Moshe has gone a long time, day after day after day, and we've got a lot of people, you know, they don't have their focus they started grumbling and they started complaining and they started, where is he and what's happened? Maybe he died up there. How will we ever know? What are we going to do? And they apparently looked at Aharon enough to, to say, okay, he could be the leader, but, but we need somebody, we need something more. Make us a God. Make us a God. We, we don't have a God now. He's brought them out of slavery. He's crossed them through the Red Sea on dry ground. It wasn't even muddy. And then he drowns the Egyptian army. He's been feeding them daily. That's their problem. But people are people. And so they decide they need to make this, this idol. And right there I think, if you're making it, how can it have power? How can it be more powerful than you who is making it? But they're making it. And it is interesting. Aharon told them, all of them, give me your earrings. The men and the women, then your <coughs> earrings. <laughs> they knew under the sun today. But I think we can take a lesson from Yaakov, from Jacob's time. And when Jacob was, he had been given the name Israel. But it's when God's reconfirming the name of Israel. It's when he's finally coming all the way back home. He's been back to the promised land from his time that he went off and he married and, and all the 20 years back there. But he's been in the land close to 10 years at this point. And he's not gone down yet to the Beersheba area where Yitzhak, his father, is. And he is the, the son that is going to be the son of the birthright that's needing to be down there. So he should be coming for that reason. He also should be coming because at Baal he made the promise to God that you bring me back here. So God moves in, works through circumstances to get him to move. And when he is coming into that place where God's going to consider he's really home and he's where he's supposed to be and ready to carry out his duties in that position, he has his whole family, which is large, the, the servants, everyone, he has them all clean house. They got rid of the idols that some had brought with them. We know that Rachel brought her father's, and I do not believe she brought them to use them, but she had brought them and hidden them. There were others among them that had come out of idolatry, and they were at that time also to strip themselves of their earrings. It, the earrings at that time, it was known that they used them as charms in worship to false gods. Oh, when you know that, it makes it a little different. 
why they took those, and I believe it's the same idea, the earrings they had, where did they get them? Egypt. Exactly. What was Egypt notorious for? Idolatry. <laughs> Worshipped all kinds of gods. So I think those earrings they had in their ears were in idolatrous practices. And they took them and they brought them together and Aharon <coughs> molded this, this golden calf, Vagabalt, and even <laughs> says it's what brought them up out of Egypt. You know, this is where I know God is long-suffering. <laughs> this is where I know he's patient. Because I think I'd be tempted to say, oh yeah? <laughs> well, I'll show you a thing or two. <laughs> And God does take them to task over it. We know that it's not something that God took lightly at all. We know that when God tells Moshe what's going on and Moshe comes down, he, he breaks the commandments because they've already been broken, so it really shows what has happened. But notice what Moshe does. After he dealt with the people, he melted down, the, he crushed it, he put it in the water, he made them drink it, which should have given them a stomach ache. <laughs> it, after that, he said, okay, it's the next day. I'm going to go back up on the mountain. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to see if there's any way to atone for this. And he stood in the gap. He stood before a holy God to try to find mercy. And it's God's testing him too to see what's really in his heart. And God lets him know his anger toward the people. And Moshe says, well, if you're not going to spare them, Block my name out of the book. Yes. He was willing to lose his life. That's a real leader that cares about the people. He had that heart for them. He knew that what they had done was wrong, but he he tried to atone even by giving his own life in their place. That's amazing grapes, really. Yes. That, that was there that Moshe had, because especially when you know how much they complained at him and how much grief they gave him. God says to him, okay, I made a promise. You'll lead them on to the land I promised, but I'm not going with you. Because if I'm in their midst, I just might destroy them. And I would, you know, we could never blame God for that. But this is where Moshe stood in the gap again. And he spoke again, and he pleaded for the mercy of God. But there's a little more in there that we have to realize. Adonais has spoke to Moshe's <laughs> to a friend. They had a personal friend relationship, and this is close friends. And God even said, you have found a favor. I know you by name. And you know, God always has a name for his children. So this is very, very precious. And he brings it to the point where God does say, okay, my presence will go with you. But it's in the midst of this, all this that's going on, that Moshe even asks, I want to see your glory. Mm -hmm. You know, he had gone to God for mercy. He knew God as a God of love a God of compassion. He had gone to him in that. And he asked, to me it's, it's that, it just shows how close they were. I just got you to be willing to go on with us, and yet I'm not satisfied. It's Yaakov clinging to the angel of the Lord, saying, I'm not letting go to bless me. And I think Moshe felt like he had stood in the gap and he was bringing this you know, to a place where they could go on with God, and it's like, I, I just, I, I want a little more of you. Yeah. I want to see your glory. Mm -hmm. And God finds a way to accommodate him in that. We know that. We know that he put him in the, the hollow of the cleft, and the Hebrew tells us that what he saw, God passed by, and he saw that which was left behind. Mm -hmm. And the best way I can describe it is if you look at a light bulb without a shade around it, and you see that glow, you turn off that light, and there's that afterglow. It doesn't hurt your eyes like when you try to look at the light without the shade. It's a little less, but it's still, nonetheless, you see. And that's, I think, the best we can get to it, but why did Moshe feel that he could ask for this? What was he drawing on? You see, he'd had an intimate time with God. And in this parsha, God introduces us. 
and I wish I could have had a recorder on Janet last week. I'm sure she doesn't even remember what she said. But she got up here for a moment, and I thought all week and could never remember why she brought it out. Mm -hmm. But I heard the love, the respect, and the tenderness mm -hmm. when you spoke to us about the yod hey vav hey name of God. Mm -hmm. This is what God gave Moshe, and we cannot do it justice. Mm -hmm. This name, in this time, when he introduces Moshe to a new name and a new, I, I believe it somehow is the glory of God. Don't ask me how. I can't. My words are not going to be satisfactory. But in this, God does give 13 attributes of himself. I'm going to fly through those. He starts out with his name Adonai as the Lord, the compassionate source of all life. And then his Adonai, Lord, as the creator of the universe. And then his El, the strong, the almighty, the omnipotent God. And then his Rachum, merciful God. Mm -hmm. Then his Hanun, gracious God, pouring out gracious grace mm -hmm. freely. Then his Erech Abayim, slow to anger, patient. Was he not with the children of yes, Israel? Yeah. Was he not? Is he not with us <laughs> today? Yeah. Wow, wow. And that idiom in there does mean a long-suffering patience. Think of those words. Just let that, as, as I fly on, Rav Chesed, abundant in love and mercy. And that's extended to both the righteous and to the wicked. Whether they receive it or not, he extends it. Rob Emmet, the truth. The Lord is truthful and faithful in carrying out his promises. And it goes on that the, the chesed, which without trying to get into all the words, is, is chesed, is mercy, is grace, is so much more that's passed down for thousands of generations. That's down through us today. Then he says he's the Lord who forgives iniquity and he forgives transgression, and he forgives sin. And there are differences. There's, there's the knowing what you're doing, and there's the not knowing what you're doing. There's the rebelliousness. They can be categorized as you break those three down, but God says he does all three. He forgives that iniquity. He forgives that sin. He forgives that, what was my third? I already sure. forgot. Right. Transgression. <laughs> and then it's tied up with nachet. The Lord will not cancel out the punishment, but he'll clear the guilt for those who genuinely turn to him and Teshuvah. Moshe was showing Teshuvah. He was repenting for the people representing, falling on his face before a holy God and pleading for this mercy, this grace, all that is in that phenomenal name. I've told you our God is ineffable. That name alone is an ineffable name of our God. And yes, we are taught to revere it and to respect it and to stand in awe and amazement of it. And in this, on the basis of who our God is, he says, I'll go on with you, I'll pardon their iniquity and their sin, and he'll even take them as his possession. You see, at this moment when Moshe went up, he had to been thinking, it's all over. There's no tabernacle. There's no God dwelling with us because he said he wasn't going to dwell with us. It's all over. Everything that's been building, all this excitement, all of this hope, gone. And yet, because he was willing to go in to God and ask, and because God was willing to show him who he is. I cannot contemplate the rush that Moshe must have felt mm -hmm. to be forgiven. Mm -hmm. To know that it's not just forgiveness, but that he's going to walk with us again. Mm -hmm. He's going to be with us. We're going to tabernacle with him. And so God does say, I'll cut covenant with you again. 
bring up the tablets and I'll write them again because, you know, he broke the first, but he does. And he promises to, to Moshe that he'll drive out the inhabitants. He will do so much for them if they will be obedient, if they will worship him, keep Shabbat. There are so many things they were to do. All of this that Moshe is, is taking in and God saying, write down my words that we know God also wrote. That I can imagine the way he was writing. You know, when we think about those who wrote our books in our Bible, and I, I, we know it was by the Spirit of God that was filling them to write. And I imagine they're writing as fast as they can and, and trying to understand. But we're told that God literally wrote on the tablets. Mm -hmm. yes. And in Hebrew we say it's the Ten Words. You call it the Ten Commandments. He's given those to, to Moshe. And now he, Moshe has seen his glory. Mm -hmm. Just that what was left behind. And even that was enough that he comes down glowing. Mm -hmm. Glowing. <clears throat> It's not the end of the story. No. It's not the end. No. That covenant was great. God's promise is mixed in with that. Amazing. God's grace, his love, his mercy, his continuance, they are his people. He is their God. They will go into the land he promised. It will be theirs. And he'll root out the enemies. All of that there. But as great as that was, my message tonight is all about better better. Because God raised up our prophet, Jeremiah. Time has passed. Our people have sinned so unforgivingly that now God's saying, I'm going to allow you to go into captivity because that's what it's going to take to wake you up to get you to turn back to your God. And he got this so much with Jeremiah. Tells him, buy property, even though it's going to be going off in exile, buy property. It's going to be yours. You're going to have the deed to it. But he says, there's a better covenant. This has been a good covenant, but there's a better covenant. This was a good tabernacle. There's a better tabernacle. And he, he, we read it in chapter 31. If you're then in the complete Jewish, start with verse 30. Otherwise, start with verse 31. And I love it in the English to use the word behold. Every time we read that behold, remember, wake up, sit up, take notice, don't miss it. Behold! <laughs> the days are coming, says Adonai, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Yah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by their hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. That's right where we are. We get that one. Because they, for their part, violated my covenant, mm. even though I, for my part, was a husband to them. Mm. He didn't break his covenant. For this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says Adonai. I will put my Torah, their instru the instructions, his words, I will put my Torah within them. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. No longer will any of them teach his fellow community member or brother. No one and I. For they will know me from the least to the greatest. Because, and don't miss it, is because I will forgive their wickednesses, their iniquity. I will remember their sins no more. And again, I say, hallelujah. <laughs> wow. That's what Moshe had pleaded for, to be pardoned, to have their sin forgiven. And the Lord saying, I'm not even going to remember it. I'm going to wipe it out. This covenant, God had given them this first one to reveal to them, to teach them. But don't miss, it's all a picture of Moshiach. But it's going to show them how they fall short, what they need. And then he doesn't leave them in a needy place. He gives them everything they need. In a rapid fire, and I'll come visit this again sometime if you want. Yeah. Let me can compare the old covenant. Notice I'm not saying the old scriptures. I'm not talking about <laughs> everything from... 
from Bereshit to, in your case, Malachi. It's, it's uh, the Chronicles in our Jewish Bibles. But I'm comparing the, that first covenant with the new covenant, with the Brit Chadashah. The original, the old, was static, written on stone. This new is dynamic. It's written in the hearts. The old was glorious. The finger of God wrote it. It was a relationship that they were in with him. But the new is even more glorious. The old was to come to an end. It was pointing to Mashiach. The new will never end. Do I'm saying that we do away with commandments? No. When is it ever okay to commit murder? <laughs> when is it ever okay to, to covet, to lie, to steal? No, we're not saying that that, but the purpose of it. It was a tutor to show them they were falling short. When the new was there that could be put in their hearts, then they didn't need the external, they didn't need the static, they didn't need the stone. That was a ministry condemning them. The law could not save them. It could only show them they're condemned. The new is the ministry of reconciliation. It's the relationship. One was powerless to save, the other is powerful to save. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah. It is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. The other was outer, it was the flesh. This is the inner, this is the spirit. Remember what I said is going to come for Ali? <laughs> he was filled with the spirit. We are such a privileged people to live in this time when we can be filled with the Spirit. The one was the law of Moses, the law of Moshe, that's what it's called. This is the law of Messiah. The law of sin and death is what Moshe could give to the people. And Mashiach gave them the Spirit of life. I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. One was just a shadow. And a shadow is great, but if I see you, and I'm greeting you, you're outside in the sunlight, and I come up and I start greeting your shadow. <laughs> what a, oh, the real is so much better. I'm going to hug the real. I'm going to fill the real. This is the substance. The old had to be sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, and the new was one sacrifice. The old being a yearly atonement, the new being an eternal, a forever covenant. The old being the earthly tabernacle, the new being the heavenly tabernacle. Better. 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 The superiority, the glory. Now, if that which worked death, the law, by means of a written text engraved on stone tablets came with glory, and we know Moshe, Moshe we saw the glory there. Such glory that even the people of Israel couldn't stand to look at Moshe's face because of his brightness, even though that brightness was already fading away. Mm -hmm. How much more glorious this one. And it never fades away. And that, that fading away, the covering of the veil, and because we started late, and I see how late it is, I've got far too much to give you. <laughs> Let me just cut through the chase and bring you. That veil is teaching us a lot. We know that it literally was a picture of the flesh of Mashiach. That when he died on that cross, that veil rent pulled open. Yes. The blood put on the mercy seat. Yes. The way in made open forever. Yes. And the blood was placed on the mercy seat in heaven. So I yes. love to say that God pulled back the curtain of heaven. Yes. Opened the way. He pinned it back with two nails. Mm -hmm. And he made it open for us. How much more glorious. Mm -hmm. That's the greater. Moshe, he was great. And he stood in the gap for our people. But Yeshua, even greater, has stood in the gap for all mankind. He is the only one who could take our sin on him. And then it could be washed away in his sinless blood so that we are forgiven forever. I'll remember their sins no more. And just as a little sidelight, when Satan pops his ugly little head up and reminds you of your sin of the past, uh, remind him of his future. <laughs> and if you're bringing a 
it up on yourself. I'm going to tell you, God says that he threw your sins away as far as the east is from the west. And the east and the west never meet. And Corey Ten Boom's way of cutting through it was saying, he buried him in the deepest, the deepest of oceans. And then he put up a sign that says, no fishing. <laughs> Moshe could stand in that gap because of the attributes of our God. Yeshua being the attributes of our God and living color stood in the gap and bought it for all mankind, for all time. Because what matters isn't the external, it's a matter of the heart. And Yeshua tried to teach them that the whole time he was here. He would point to the law and he would show them how they were caught up on the letter of the law. You know, God forbid they do this. And he would say, but it says this. And he would show them, give you a couple of really quick examples. You've got, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think what I can do fastest. Shabbat being made for man or man being made for Shabbat. It was Shabbat that was made for man. It was not wrong to spare an animal on Shabbat. And I go to my time in Israel, and in a very religious community, there was a huge pipe that had broken open, and the waters were flooding the streets, pouring down the streets, a waste of a precious commodity. And the Orthodox men standing in a circle talking, while it's just feet from them gushing out of this pipe and flowing down the streets. And our tour guide was quick to say to us all, they won't pick up a wrench to stop that until Shabbat has ended. Yeah. Oh You'll really think God cares if they pick up the wrench and stop the leak. But that's how they saw. The rich young ruler came to Yeshua and said, I've kept all the commandments. What more do I need to do? And the Lord didn't call him out and say, oh, no, you haven't kept those commandments. The Lord met him where he was at. He thought he was a good, righteous, Jewish man. And God said, then do one more, or the Lord said, do one more thing. Sell your goods and come give them to the poor and come and follow me. It broke his heart. He couldn't do it because he was good at the letter of the law, but he didn't have the heart of the law. The heart of the law would have been shown by his expression of love and care to those in need. It would have been a radical heart change. He was full of himself. He didn't care about the poor. He didn't care about the needy. He didn't have the heart motive. And all the way through Yeshua showed, it's not what the letter is saying, it's what the meaning is. And he showed how he had the authority of God because he would constantly tell them, but, and he would correct them, and he would bring out to the truth to them, and he would show them the, the heart of the law. What is it? He summed it up in one. Wow. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's all. That's, that's all. That's all. That's all. You don't have to worry about 613. Let's come down to one. <laughs> Let's just come down to one. But just as that glory in Moshe faded, in us, we cannot do it. And the Lord knew that. God knew that. That's why he provided himself the lamb. He did it all. And as he puts his spirit in us, now we are a new creation. And in that spirit, the same way, my mic is dying, Roger. In that, I'll just be loud. In that spirit, the Roger. same way that Bazael could make the tabernacle, we with the Spirit of the Lord, can fulfill the law. Not the law that condemns, but the law that brings life. That's why he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That's what he's saying, and he opened the way, as I've already said. The glory of the law is it represented the holiness of our God. God's glory, God's grace, but what greater glory when we see it in Yeshua, the better, the better. And, and Romans 3, 20, 21, but now quite apart from Torah, God's way of making people righteous in his sight has been made clear. Although the Torah and the prophets gave their witness at it all, 
It is the righteousness that comes from God through the faithfulness of Yeshua HaMashiach to all who continue trusting, all who live in that faith. That's what was given. God gave grace. He gave truth. He gave it all Amen. in Yeshua. Amen. The Torah was given through Moshe. Grace and truth came through Yeshua, Amen. the Messiah. That's what we're seeing in this parasha. The greater, the better. I'm building us up. We're going to come to a point in Davarim where God says, there's a prophet that's, that's like Moshe. He's greater than Moshe. When he comes, you need to hear him. Do we have a sneak peek? Yeah. We have a sneak peek. Don't worry, I'm quitting right now. Unless Bruce wants it. But that, that, praise God today. Bask in that glory. Bask in that glory. He will meet you. He will fill the room. You've got a little taste with our music, our worship tonight. That can be yours anytime, anywhere. Amen. Go up to the mountain. Get in his glory. You'll never be the same. Amen. It'll shine. But I tell you honestly, it's not going to come from the outside. It's going to come from the inside. Because that's where his spirit is. So, open up your heart and let the sun shine out. <laughs> <laughs>